You might be wondering, why didn't I just cross those lines in the middle and then I'd have a center point as well, which is super useful. And the answer is, where were you two weeks ago? Shut up, that's why. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on my big steam engine build this week. We made the crankshaft last time, and now we need something for that crankshaft to run in. So let's make some main bearings. Here are the castings for my main bearings. They're standalone pillow block style bearings, and they ride on the inner portions of the crankshaft there. In fact, these bearings are very wide and very beefy. However, they are cast iron, and the crankshaft is steel. And steel running in cast iron is okay, I suppose, but it's not my favorite thing. Now, there is enough meat here on these bearing caps to probably add a bronze bearing in there. So I think I'm actually going to try that. I'll do some experiments here to see the plausibility of this. Quick perspective check though, these bearings are larger than the entire bottom end of the previous steam engine that I built. So once again, everything on this engine is huge. All right, let's get to work. I'm going to start actually over on the lathe with that bronze material because I want to make a test bearing to see if the dimensions that I can fit into that cap are going to be substantial enough for a bearing. I measured how much space I have there and you know, you can measure things and look at drawings and make CAD models, but sometimes you just have to hold the part in your hand for that intuition to kick in of whether it's going to be strong enough. So I'm going to make a little mock-up bearing here, not full width to save on material. I just want to see the thicknesses of everything to see if it's going to work out. So as you can see, it's going to be a plain bronze bushing with flanges at each end to retain it in the bearing castings there. So I drill that out to as large as I can on this lathe, and then I'll bore it out to final dimension. I'm aiming for about a thou and a half larger than the crankshaft, just enough for some oil in there and a free running fit. And that is almost there, won't quite go in. So I just did a final spring pass with the boring bar. Spring pass, if you're not familiar, is just doing another pass with the same cross slide value. And that takes any remaining deflection out of the boring bar or the part. And more often than not, we'll enlarge it just that extra little bit that you needed. And now that's a perfect fit. I'll knock all those sharp corners off and now I'm ready to part it off. So it looks like just a little ring that you'd wear on your finger, not a full width bearing, because I only care about the end features here. Oh, and Yahtzee. There's the final bearing there. It's actually a little snug on that crankshaft, so I'll make the final part just a scooch bigger than that. One more reason why making a test part never hurts. But now I can hold this thing in my hands, and I can really see that the 50 thou wall thickness that I have room for is going to be enough. Like, that feels plenty sturdy. With that decided, let's get to work on the actual bearings. These castings have some very large sprues on them, so I'll chop those off with the bandsaw, and then I gotta separate the pillow block base from the bearing caps as well. Now, over to the surface plate, because I'm gonna do something that I didn't do on my last engine. I'm gonna do layout on these castings. I read a lot of vintage manual machining textbooks. One of those has an excellent chapter on casting layout. The idea here is you create a reference surface on the casting, and then you put it on the surface plate and you mark out ahead of time all the features that you're going to want on that casting so that you can see where they're going to land and you're not guessing about whether you're going to have enough casting material here or there or you know trying to keep the casting straight things like that in this case i want a center line on the ears where the bolt holes go and on the top arch there of the bearing cap i want to make sure that my machined surfaces end up evenly spaced around the casting and that the unmachined features end up looking straight when I'm done. So I eyeballed the center line on one side of the cap and then eyeballed it on the other side and got it level doing that. And then once I had a level that I liked, then I scribed that line all the way around the casting there. So now I have a center line there and then I did the same thing in the other direction for the ears. So there's basically two center lines that I can work from. Over to the mill now, I'm going to put some old emery paper on the fixed jaw there. That's going to grip the casting better, take up any imperfections, and also protect the jaws of my vise from this nasty grit on these castings. And then I'm going to use a wiggler here just to get the height set right. Because the ears are set back from the movable jaw, it's hard to get them aligned, so using a pointer like that, I can go back and forth until the pointer lines up on the line in the same place on both sides, and then I know that casting is level according to my center line. And now I can machine the rest of the sprue off the top there and be confident I'm going to end up with a face that's pretty square to the unmachined arch details there on the casting. 
Now I'm going to flip this over and I'm using an adjustable parallel there for the perfect height and I'm going to create the opposite face and I'm just cleaning up these faces and I'm leaving them oversized. These two opposite faces are not going to be necessarily parallel because the back side of that bearing cap is still unmachined so it's not a reference surface that I have there so bear with me here for a moment. At this point I realized I really should have made a center on the middle of this casting using my two crossed lines there. So I did it this way instead I eyeballed it with a center punch there. And once I have a center punch then using dividers I can scribe the final dimension that I want and just make sure that my machining is ending up centered on the casting. And also I can check how much further I have to go here. And now I know how much to remove and from which side. Back into the mill now I'm going to face the bottom. So I got rid of the emery paper on the fixed jaw because I've got a machined surface there, but I'm using copper wire on the other side because again, those surfaces are not likely to be parallel. Then using an indicator, I'm just getting that cast surface roughly horizontal. You should be able to get it within five to eight thou, even with a cast surface because the quality of the castings is usually good enough for that. And then with that reasonably level, then I can face this off and I know that once again, this machined face isn't gonna end up too crooked relative to the cast details. Now my order of operations on all this has been pretty muddled. I apologize for that. I'm learning more and more about how to machine castings every time I do it, but I do a little better job here on the next part. Now I have a reference square corner with those two faces. So that corner goes down and back in the fixed jaw. And then once again, using copper wire on the cast surface. And now I can remachine this top surface or rather finish machining it down to final dimension. And I know it's gonna be square to the bottom and parallel to the opposite face. Onto the pillow blocks now. I've got a little better order of operations now, I think, after learning from those caps. So I'm gonna set this up first like this, getting it level once again, as I did with the caps, but I'm gonna machine this bottom face first and create a reference surface before I do the layout on the casting. And the surface finish on that was terrible because I've got a bad insert on that face mill. So I came back in with the flat cutter to clean that up so that I can live with myself and get some sleep tonight. On that one, I'm gripping it just with the emery paper on both jaws. On the second one though, here's a pitfall of doing that. You can see that my first pass only touched the very back side of the casting there. And that means the casting is sitting too crooked in the jaws, even with the emery. Rather than continuing and ending up with a crooked casting, I put some copper wire on one side to remove the influence of that jaw. And then I brought the indicator out and I leveled it up front to back a little better by tapping it in. And then I continued to machine that bottom surface. Now with that machined reference face on my angle plate there on the surface plate, now I can once again eyeball a center line by just lining up the center of that curvature there on both sides and making sure I'm you know, visually centered as best I can on both ends. And then I know the part is visually horizontal as best I can. You know, these are rough castings. This is never gonna be perfect. You just gotta do the best you can. And that center line is gonna serve me very well here on the next few operations, because now I can set it up in the vise like this, and I can use that center line on the top edge of the vise jaw there to get the part horizontal. I'll start by machining down the rest of that sprue there. I didn't get too close there with the bandsaw, just to be safe but I don't want to have to file the rest of that down. So I filed it just to where the end mill is kissing the tops of the bumps on the cast surface there, and then I'll blend that together later with a file. Now I can get down to business here and machine the, what I'm calling thrust face of the pillow block. The pillow blocks are supposed to be a certain width, but the drawing doesn't actually specify exactly which surfaces to machine. So I decided to machine it this way with the base of the pillow block forming a thrust surface of sorts for the crankshaft, but then not touching the base to give it the appearance that it's sort of sitting on a pedestal. With that first face cleaned up, now I can once again get out the dividers and figure out how well centered my machining is and where I need to remove the remainder of this material. I wanna try and remove equal material from both sides of the casting so that the finished surfaces end up centered. So now I know and I can flip it over and using the reference surfaces that I created on the bottom and that one side there, I can machine this side down. Once again, I'm leaving all these surfaces a little oversized here still, and you'll see why in a moment. That was a much better order of operations than I did on the bearing caps. I got the same result here of three square and parallel reference surfaces with a lot fewer setups. All right, so there's the bearing caps there. They're gonna sit on there like that. 
and you can see that they're both basically the same width on those machined faces, but everything is still oversized. So now I can set up to do the top faces of these pillow blocks, and I'm using some packing blocks there to reference those machined surfaces to the vise jaws. And I'll tap, tap, tap that down. And now I can machine this top face, and I know it's gonna be square to the sides and parallel to the bottom. And I rotated the inserts on that face mill, so that finish is excellent. This face I'm machining down to final dimension right now. So I did that as best I could measuring in the mill. And unfortunately, I did end up a couple thou undersized here, but it is flat and parallel, so that's good. That's okay if it's a little undersized, as long as the other block is made to match so that the crankshaft will sit level. So I just machined the other one a couple thou under, and we're good to go. And the rest of this process is very much like how you would do an eccentric strap or a connecting rod where I'm going to now make the bolt holes for the bearing cap and I'm going to bolt the two pieces together and then do the rest of the machining with everything bolted up. I'll start by centering up by eye with a center drill on my center punch mark there and I'll center drill that now but I'm not going to use that for much until later and then I'm going to center drill the two ears there for the mounting bolts using DRO to get the spacing right. And if I did my job right, those holes should land right on my scribed center lines there, which thankfully they did. These are drilled for clearance for the uh, quarter 20 mounting hardware that they supply in the kit. And when possible, it's always nice to do a spot face on a bolt clamping surface like that on a casting because bolts don't like to clamp on a rough cast surface very well, so an end mill makes a nice job of that. So that's the bolts they supply with the kit, and yeah, they're big, ugly, slot-headed screws, and they won't stay. But for now, they're going to do for mocking these parts up and getting everything machined. Next, I align the parts as best I can by eye and by feel here, and clamp them together. And then I can set them up in the mill, and I'm going to drill and tap the other side of the bearing cap there. So I've got a gauge pin in the quill there, the same size as the clearance hole, and I use that to center the mill up on that hole. And now I've got a stubby drill here, the same size as the clearance hole that I drilled because the setup is very tall, so the stubby drill was a lifesaver here. And I use that to just make a little dimple there in the bottom. The bearing cap acts as a drill guide for that. And then I can come in with the tapping drill size and it's gonna center itself on that dimple and stay straight for the rest of the trip. The drawing actually called for through holes on those. I'm not really sure why, perhaps just to make the tapping easier. There doesn't seem to be any need for those to be through holes, but I followed the drawing there. And then I just tapped these for the quarter 20 hardware. And now I can bolt down one side of this. Space is tight in here, so I'm using a socket wrench there, but I can bolt down one side and then unclamp the other side and then do the same procedure over there. And nothing will have moved. Now I've got both sides bolted down and I can finish the machining. But while I'm here in this setup, I might as well do the bolt holes for the base. I'm just checking the positions on the DRO to see where they're gonna land, make sure they're gonna land in nice places on the casting relative to where the drawing says they're supposed to be, using the DRO to position them, and they look good. I did adjust them a little bit. It doesn't really matter where these holes are because they're gonna be transferred to the base anyway. I just want them to look reasonably well positioned on the casting. These were spot-faced as well. Luckily, I had an end mill that was just long enough to do that with. That's looking good. Yeah, I know, more ugly slot-headed screws. Don't worry, I'll be making bolts. After bringing both bearings to this point, I was now trying to decide how to make sure the bores end up aligned because they're freestanding bearings. They need to be perfectly aligned when they're done. So my first thought was something like this. I would set them up on an angle plate and drill and bore them together in situ like this, and that would guarantee that the bores are aligned. If this were a full-size engine, what they would probably do is set them up on the base like this and then line bore them in situ, and that once again would guarantee that the bores were concentric and aligned regardless of how perfectly mounted or not the castings are. Then I thought about this for a while and decided, you know, that's excessively complicated because the lateral position and angle of the bearings doesn't matter because you can always adjust that before you bolt them down. All that matters is that the bores are the same height off the deck on both bearings. And that's actually easy to do just by setting them up in the vise like this and edge finding off the bottom reference surface on each pillow block. If I do that, then the bearings will be sufficiently aligned. 
And if by some freak chance that they weren't, you could always shim one or the other with, you know, a half thou or a one thou shim, but honestly, that really won't be necessary if you do an edge find carefully. And this setup is much simpler, much more rigid, and I can do some other operations while I'm here, so I feel pretty good about this. So now is the time, though, to finish these side faces down to final dimension. Remember, I left them oversize, and that's because I wanted to finish them with the parts bolted together, as you see here. I measured how much more I had to remove to get them to the right width, and then I'm taking that same amount off both sides. Once the second side is done, I mark that because I want these bearing caps to remain paired up and oriented as they are now for all time. The other reason I marked that is because this face was now machined in the same setup that I'm about to use to do the bore. So this face is going to be very square to that bore, so I want this face to be the one touching the sides of the crankshaft. For the Y position, as I said, it's actually easy. I just edge find from the base. The X position, though, is tricky. I want it visually centered on the casting, so I'm measuring the width of the casting roughly at the split line there, and then I've set my odd leg dividers to half that distance, and I'm taking a few marks at different angles all the way around the casting, and then where all of those marks roughly intersect, I can kind of eyeball that center area there and position the center drill on that. This is really the best thing I could think of to do with a rough casting like this. To double check my guess here on where the center is, I give the center drill a little twist by hand there, makes a center mark, and now I can use that to feel around with the odd leg and make sure that things feel roughly centered. And it looks good. The dividers are lightly dragging on the casting all the way around, so I think this is about as centered as we're going to get it. These are often not perfect after you drill it anyway. You find out, oh, well, actually it was a little one way or the other, but there's only so much you can do with castings. Now I drilled it out in a series of larger and larger drills. One thing you want to check before drilling a bore like this is you also want to make sure that your center drill mark is really well centered on the split line of the two casting pieces there. Because if it isn't, if the arc of that circle is more than 50% above or below that line, then the crankshaft or bearing or whatever's going in this bore won't go in properly after you remove the cap because you're going to have too much of an arc. You're going to have more than 180 degrees of arc above or below the line and the two pieces won't fit together. If it's a little bit misaligned, you can cheat by chamfering the edges generously, but something to be aware of. Then to finish that out, I'm going to use the boring head. So I'm just touching off here on the inside of that bore, and then I'll finish this up in a series of passes. So I'm boring this out 100 thou larger than the drawing says to, because once again, I'm adding a 50 thou wall thickness bronze bushing in there to act as a plain bearing. This went very well. Cast iron drills and bores extremely nicely. It's very pleasant to machine this stuff. However, this was not fast. Because these bearings are so thick, each one of these boring operations takes quite a while, and I might have thought of a way to do this on the lathe if I'd thought ahead and thought how slow this was going to be on a boring head on a mill that has no power down feed. But, you know, put on some music and give your wrists a little bit of a workout there on the fine feed on the mill, and eventually you will get there. Machining requires nothing if not patience. Okay, that should be it, so I'll check it with my bore gauge here, or snap gauge if you want to drive commenters crazy. And survey says, well, would you look at that? Even a blind squirrel hits a dimension sometimes. Now, a little more boring to do, though. I want to do a counter bore for the flanges on those bearings. You saw from my mock-up bearing that there's going to be a flange at each end, and that is going to center the bearings, locate them, and keep them in place. So that is a very close fit on that. That's actually a little bit tight, but my mock-up bearing is actually a couple thou oversized. So it ends up being a perfect go-no-go -go gauge for this dimension, and that will do nicely. So I brought both bearings to that point, looking pretty good so far. Then I still have to flip each one over and do the counter bore on the other side. For that, I centered up each bore once again with my coaxial indicator there, and then did the counter bores on those sides. Something was bothering me about this bearing setup, though. There's no way to locate these bearing caps, so I looked at trying to put some pins in there somewhere. My patrons suggested this as well. There just isn't space, though, anywhere to do that. When I look at the drawing, it specifies a shouldered bolt, which is maybe supposed to locate the caps, but it also does not show a smooth bore in the bottom. It only shows threads, so maybe not. 
I don't know. I could have done a shouldered bolt to locate them, but it's too late for that. I would have had to have made those bolts first and drilled and bored them in situ before machining the faces. So instead, I'll rely on the bearings to do it. Now I had intended to use this 932 bearing bronze that I have, but unfortunately I don't have enough of it. These bearings are very wide. So instead I went into the junk pile and I found this stuff. This was donated by a viewer a while back. This is Ampco 18. It's an alloy of aluminum bronze specifically intended for hard wearing bearings. So this should be just the thing. Unfortunately, it's just a hair too small on nominal for what I want, but I think I can make it work. I can squeeze these bearings out of it. So I'll start by facing off the end, as is tradition. Now aluminum bronze alloys have a reputation for being ornery to machine, so this might be interesting. However, the surface finish on that is incredible. Look at that. Wow. I hope the rest of the operations go that well. I'll get some tail support in there and now I can machine the OD. I'm trying to find the lightest possible cut I can take that will clean up the OD here because I don't want to lose too much dimension on this stock. Unfortunately, that's about the best I could do. You can see from the flashes as, as it spins that it isn't totally cleaned up. And yeah, unfortunately the surface of this stuff is really rough and it was gonna take a deep cut to clean it up. However, most of that will be machined away because of the shape of these bearings. So I'm gonna roll with this and I'll clean it up as best I can. I just don't want to lose any more on that dimension. Now I can find the edge with my grooving tool here and I'm going to machine the shoulders of this bearing. It's basically a barbell shape so I can establish the depth at each side but I'm leaving it a little bit oversized still and I'll do a finishing cut later. Once I've got my width and shoulders established it'll be a lot easier to do the rest of this operation here. I measured those shoulders and then widened them a little bit as needed to hit my dimension. This next part got very screechy, so for your benefit I went ahead and switched the lathe over to Ocean Sounds. And now I have room to come in with the turning tool and remove that center material there, which is a lot easier with the turning tool. I will say about this aluminum bronze, it does turn noticeably tougher than phosphor bronze, so it doesn't like the grooving tool very much. After turning that center section down to match the depth that I established with the grooving tool on the ends, then I took a final measurement here to see how much I have to do on my finishing cut. Just make sure I don't have any taper here. And then I also double checked the width with parallels just to make extra sure I'm right on there. And I'm actually a little narrow still on the width. And I need a few more thou of depth. So that's good, that's what I want. Now I can go in with the grooving tool, widen that shoulder slightly, go into the final depth, and then engage the power feed in reverse so I'm feeding left to right here and just run the grooving tool down the length of the part taking a very light cut. I find this works really well with grooving tools to establish exact inner groove diameters like this and the grooving tool seems to also act like an old school shear tool because you always end up with a really outstanding finish when you do a really light cut laterally with a grooving tool like that. And that is almost there. That bearing almost fits in there but it's a little tight and this is, I think, down to I didn't chamfer the inside corners of the bore on that bearing cap, and I really should have. Instead, I had to compensate by undercutting a few thou on the bearing here. Not ideal. I would have preferred the bearing to be untouched, but that was enough to make it fit. I did chamfer those bearing caps by hand as best I could, but they needed a little more help than that. But with that, the bearing now clamps on there nicely, and that seems like a good fit. So I think I'm ready to drill and bore these now. I will say this aluminum bronze drills beautifully. It's a little squealy and it heats up like crazy, so I'm using lots of WD-40 as coolant and lubricant there, but it does drill very nicely. So I worked up to the largest drill that I have, and then I was able to go in there with the boring bar and finish it, just like I did with the test part there. This order of operations was chosen to try and minimize the stresses on the part because the final part is so thin, it's only 50 thou wall thickness. That's why I made sure that the boring was the very last part that I did, because that's the lowest tool pressure of all these operations that I'm needing to do on these parts. Now with a little deburr, I'll just check my final dimension here with the telescoping bore gauge. Once again, aiming for about a thou and a half over my crankshaft size. I did in fact hit that, and that crankshaft is a beautiful fit in there. Slides right in, no play, but it spins freely. Very nice. So a little deburring, now I can part this off, and Yahtzee.
there's my final bearings. I made two of those and they should seat nicely down in the bearing caps there. And then I can put the caps down on top. And we've got a couple more operations to do, but I needed the bearings in place for the remainder here. Interestingly, once I torqued down those bearing caps, the crankshaft was a little bit tight. So the bearings being compressed ever so slightly there. Crankshaft still fits, but it's a little snugger than I would like. I lost some of my oil clearance there. Now that's an easy fix. With the caps still torqued in place, I just brought in my little honing tool and just ran that through very briefly. It's bronze, it cuts very fast. It doesn't take much, just a few seconds with that. And that was enough to where that crankshaft once again fits well and spins freely. That honing tool, by the way, is a master cylinder brake honing kit. Strongly recommend those for model engineering. I find all sorts of uses for those things. And finally, with the bearing in place, now I can drill and tap the oiler hole at the top of the bearing cap. I'm doing this last because the oiler is actually gonna be what keeps the bearings from spinning in the castings there. But I'll make those later. For now, I just need to drill the holes and get them aligned. Quick mock-up here on the base. Let's see how it runs. And the answer is very well. I'm very pleased with that. That seems to run beautifully. It's a little hard to hold the bearing caps in place by hand for doing this test, but that works really well. Last little thing I wanna do is finish fettling the outsides of these two parts now that they're clamped together in their final positions. Just get the edges of the castings aligned, remove any misalignment steps that might be there. And the surfaces look modeled now, but once it's painted, that all blends together. If you really wanted to, you could bead blast them or something at this point, but in my experience, once they're painted, you can't tell what was cast and what was filed and so on. There's my final bearing caps, and I'm pretty pleased with how those turned out. The bearings, I think, were a nice upgrade, and they're doing a nice job of keeping the cap and base aligned there as well. I could later also split those bearings and set up some sort of shim system to make them adjustable for wear, but honestly, this engine isn't going to see that much use, so I don't think it's necessary. There it is, mocked up with the frame, and you can see how it's all going to fit together there. This engine is a real beast, and I'm really excited to get more moving parts into it here. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed these fascinating little castings. Stay tuned for the next part in this series. Thanks to my patrons for making all this possible, and I will see you next time.